Okay, welcome back everyone. At this point, we would like to welcome our live stream participants who are joining us for the next 15 minutes of our session. Uh, my name is Kim Topping and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. My name is Min Nguyen and I go by any pronouns. And just to fill you in on what we have been talking about today and a little bit about us. So Min and I are here representing Kiri Q. We provide trainings and technical assistance to nonprofits, businesses, schools, healthcare providers, um, really helping people understand what LGBTQ plus cultural responsiveness can look like. And today in our training with TSNE, we are covering all of that. We're talking about identity and what that means to people and how we can be respectful in the language and policies that we use at our organizations. So I'll pass it over to Min to get us started thinking about inclusive strategies. Yeah, so for this live stream, we're gonna be covering a couple different strategies, kind of thinking a lot around language and what actual tangible things folks can kind of take in and use in their work uh, moving forward. Um, so the first section is just thinking about inclusive language. We really focus a lot around language because it's how we're working with each other, it's how we're relating to each other, but to be more mindful about our, the, the language that we're using. Um, so one of the first things So we've already kind of covered this in our training before, is just kind of finding alternatives to thinking about boys and girls or ladies and gentlemen. There are other ways to kind of introduce folks and to bring folks in. I've already just used one, folks is one. Uh, uh, you all can be another one, using guests. Um, with younger folk, with younger students, we can use students. Um, we also worked at a, an L, a middle school where we used the word scholars um, to kind of elevate the, the, the position of the young folks that we're working with. Um, and there are lots of other alternatives out there to uh, using, uh, not using boys and girls. And to just be mindful about, is it really important for us to use gendered uh, terms for, for certain uh, communities? Oh, that is not great. Um, okay. There we go. All right, we're back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so another one is just kind of thinking about alternatives for relationships too. So um, instead of saying, do you have a boyfriend or do you have a girlfriend or a wife or, or husband, you can kind of think about other ways to ask about, do you have a significant other? Do you have a partner? Uh, do you have a boo or a bae if you're working with younger folks? Um, maybe not everybody, but you can definitely use it with, with younger folks. Um, but the, the kind of bigger takeaway is to not be making assumptions uh, about relationships or about identities. Um, we worked with middle school students and one of, the, one of our middle school boys turned to his, his peers and said, uh, it's 2018, you can't assume my gender. And I think this is really refreshing and, and great because teenage boys are one, talking about it with each other. Um, but that they're, they're kind of mindful of like, there are ways to relate with each other and not be assuming who you're, who you're seeing, who you are, what your identities are. Does that make sense? Great. Um, and I would just add also that we, we all do this naturally as people. We notice and pay attention to signals that we see about gender and gender expression. So this is human. We make these assumptions. So it's really just the process of, of checking that, paying attention to the assumptions that we make. Um, before we make a statement about who someone is when we're interacting with them. Okay, so the next um, set of strategies is really about our, our forms, our marketing materials, the first things that people see when they interact with our organizations, right? That might be your website, it might be brochures, um, the intake forms that they fill out when they're coming into your organization. So one recommendation would be to leave a blank line for gender. So traditionally we have uh, on forms that will say gender or it will say sex and it will give you two options, male or female, man or woman. That doesn't work for everyone, so in order to be more inclusive, we can simply just put a blank line and people can identify what gender they identify with, um, very simply with that blank line. And you can think about with this with other categories of identity as well. Rather than giving options, which might be constricting, might not cover everyone that you're serving, 
you can simply put a blank line, allow them to do that for you. Okay? And uh, along with that, uh, often on legal documents, um, so for example, when we're thinking about tax documents, people do have to provide their legal name. And so, especially in hiring processes, you can have the option of people providing their legal name, but also a second option for their affirmed name. So that you're respecting the name that they use. Um, and similarly with pronouns, other things to identify themselves that you want to know about that person. Okay, and then also in your materials, including a clear statement about inclusion. And if you just look around at other nonprofits, you can see a lot of examples of inclusion statements. I'm sure you all have seen um, those examples. I just want to say with that, making sure to pair that inclusion statement with those policies and practices, right? For example, if you have um, at your organization uh, someone who is trans starts on your staff, if they're feeling like they cannot be out about their pronouns or their name, that inclusive statement might not feel like it really embodies their experience, right? So trying to think full picture about having the policy, but also uh, honoring people's experiences and making sure that what's happening in the staff culture is reflecting that on a daily basis. Okay, and I think there's a final one here, which is about uh, photos and flags. So uh, you can put a rainbow flag, uh, a trans flag, other examples of flags on your materials, just to show that you're an inclusive organization, you're welcoming. Um, I know that for me personally, when I go onto a website of an organization, am I gonna reach out to them? That's something that signals to me that maybe it's okay for me to reach out and they'll be respectful of my pronouns or, or other things that are important. And also photos. Uh, so this is important, especially for domestic violence agencies. If you only have photos of straight appearing couples, then that might signal to LGBTQ plus couples that your services aren't gonna be inclusive of them, that you might not understand um, the experiences that they're going through, et cetera. So anything that you can do to signal to people that your space is going to be inclusive. Um, this next slide is just kind of different strategies for addressing harmful language that you're hearing uh, in your work at home uh, wherever else you might be hearing any of this information. Um, so one strategy that we really like is stop it, name it, claim it. So this can be for something when people are making harmful comments uh, in, in your space. Um, it's very helpful, let, for example, saying, that's so gay. That's a, that's a comment that might be thrown around. Um, you can say, we're not gonna be doing that, just stop it. I don't like that you're using uh, negative comments towards other people, and then to claim it. I think this one is really important, is to claim why this behavior is not great for the community, for the space, um, for yourself. And, and I think this is really very helpful for folks who uh, may not identify with the community. You can still interrupt kind of harmful behaviors and say, this makes me really uncomfortable because this space is supposed to be really welcoming. We're trying to create an inclusive environment, so we're not gonna be using that kind of language with each other. Um, so stop it, name it, and claim it. I think the name it, uh, the claim it is really the most important is to make sure that you're saying why this is harmful to you um, or the community that you're working with. Uh, the next one is kind of thinking about gender roles. So this can be around uh, young folks, but this can also happen um, in your personal lives too. So people who are trying to make sure that people fit very neatly into gender roles, um, you know, like saying be a man or boys don't cry. These things are gendered um, and to be able to stop that is, is, is to try and make sure that everybody is being able to be their full selves saying, why are you trying to challenge somebody to be a man? Um, what does that mean to you? Why are you saying that? All those sorts of things are really important. Is there anything else you wanna add in? Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while we also hear that um, gender and sexual orientation is a phase or a, a certain fad. Um, and this can sometimes be folks who are not familiar with this language, with the culture, um, with this ide idea that gender and sexual orientation is, is way more complex than just uh, the binary. And so to kind of push back on this is to be able to say, this really isn't a fad. Um, there have been folks of um, 
gender non-conforming identities and different sexual orientations throughout the entire history of, of people, right? Um, and that there are queer and um, gender non-conforming folks in all different uh, cultures, religions, um, nationalities, that they exist everybody, everywhere. Um, and then just to be able to ask questions to understand, you know, like when a young person is saying that's so gay, you can ask these questions, what do you mean by that? And uh, what do you think happens when somebody who may be gay is experiencing this or hearing this? What, is that, what do you think that kind of does for folks? Um, kind of pushing back on the, be, um, on the phase and fad too, you know, like sometimes folks don't always just understand what it means and you can kind of just ask questions to understand where they're kind of coming from, where they got these ideas from, um, and then just having a conversation about it and taking the time to really uh, connect with folks about what, what, they, what they know or don't know. Um, so gender inclusivity and in trainings and curriculum. So this one can be something that you're doing with uh, your communities. Um, and just to be thinking about, oh, so I have a quick question. So uh, for those at home or here, we're gonna ask everybody to kind of think of five different LGBTQ plus people that you can think of. I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds to just kind of do this. You can write it down, you can think about it, and just kind of think. Can somebody share just one person that they can think of? Your sibling? Sibling? Yeah. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Laverne Cox is another LGBTQ person. Yes, great. Um, next one is we're going to challenge you to think of five LGBTQ people of color. Let's just take a couple seconds to do this. All right, so which one was harder for folks? The second one, right? That often it's a lot harder for people to think about other intersecting identities of LGBTQ folks, but also people of color. And why do you think this is? I think this has a lot to do with who we're exposed to, who we're talking about, who we're highlighting in our, in our um, media, in our curriculum, in our work. Um, and so to kind of think about this when you're developing trainings or when you're developing your curriculum is to try and bring in more experiences of folks who we don't always think about. You know, if we think about the entire US history, when I was growing up, I didn't ever really have opportunities to learn about queer folks or, or people of color who are um, not the mainstream folks, right? And so, there are, lots of, there are lots of queer people in history that we don't always think about. For example, Abraham Lincoln um, actually lived with a male partner for a really long time, and we didn't ever get to learn this. Um, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was also um, a woman who loved women, and sometimes we get to think about it, but it kind of depends on the curriculum or your teacher who can kind of bring this out and talk about it as a, a really important part of her identity, right? Um, okay, so just to... Remember to include women too. So uh, a lot of science, history, we don't really think about the, the um, contributions that women have brought to science and they've done a lot. Um, for example, did you all know that um, there was a Wright sister? You know, the Wright brothers who did the plane, right? She did a lot of the work and she didn't get a lot of that credit. Um, but she really helped the brothers do all of that research and, and get them into the air. And meanwhile, they are the ones who are remembered for it. Um, and then lastly, just to remember and to think about not tokenizing um, folks who do identify and kind of forcing that burden on them to do the trainings or to develop the curriculum. I think what this training is trying to do is to, to build better allies. And so that all, everybody in this room and everybody who's on the live stream is able to kind of step up and support folks who are um, part of the LGBTQ plus community and to be able to step up in, in situations, but to also advocate for more trainings and more curriculum that is inclusive for your, for your work. So our final strategy is around pronouns. You may have seen pronouns in email signatures, uh, maybe people use their pronouns in meetings during introductions. So why are pronouns important? 
Well, first of all, pronouns replace someone's name. It's really interchangeable with someone's name. So respecting someone's pronoun is, is simply respecting how they want to be referred to on a, on a regular basis. So one, one thing we can do is normalize asking for pronouns. So there's a couple ways that you can do this. You can either introduce yourself using your own pronouns. So my name is and my pronouns are. You can put them in your email signature, like I uh, mentioned just a second ago. How many people have their pronouns in an email signature? It's becoming a more common practice, right? So that's one option. You can also do that in your in-person introductions. Um, and if that's not comfortable for you, that's OK. You can also ask other people for their pronouns as well. So think about how you, how you might want to incorporate pronouns into um, in-person conversations, your online communications, et cetera. Okay, and if you make a mistake, if you mispronounce someone, that's okay. What you can do is correct yourself and move on. So think about the example, if you see a dog on the street, you're like, oh my gosh, this dog is so cute, what's his name? And they say, oh no, her name is, and what do we do? Oh, I'm so sorry, she is, et cetera, et cetera, right? We automatically correct ourselves and we move on. Okay, so same thing here. Correct yourself, move on, it doesn't need to be a big deal, um, and just practice and try to get better for the next time around. And also you can use gender neutral pronouns when you're not sure. So let's say a client is coming into your organization, you're not sure what their gender identity is, what their pronouns are, you can simply use the gender neutral terms of they, them, and theirs. They are coming to the meeting, they will be here in 15 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that concludes our inclusive language strategies. Um, for people on the live stream, if you'd like to learn more or talk more with us, we do have a website. It's kiriq.com, so K-Y-R-I-Q.com. And thank you so much for joining us.